this morning, but we're in Matthew chapter 16, and I'm excited for what God has for us. All year, we've been really centered around the idea that we are rooted to rise. In other words, that we are going to get grounded in God's Word. That's the command that you and I have, to ground ourselves, to root ourselves in Christ, and then we will grow from there. In other words, we've kind of coined it this way, that our beliefs ought to determine our behavior. And I'm going to tell you, there's great clarity in that, there's great stability in that, there's great simplicity in that, that I don't have to figure it out on my own. I get grounded in God's Word, and then when things come into my life, I let God's Word determine how I respond. And so we are in rooted to rise. Now, this morning we are going to be beginning a new study and a study that focuses in on the church. To start with, we're going to ask the simple question, what is church? If we went around and we took a poll, we would get a variety of responses as to <clears throat> excuse me, what is a church? What is it that a church is? What is it that a church does? What is it that the church ought to be? Now, we have got to understand as we come to talk about the church that the church is not a religious McDonald's trying to serve a fickle base. The church is also not a religious marketing scheme. It's not just t-shirts and bumper stickers. It's not that at all. Church is ultimately not what you think. And church is ultimately not what I think. Church is what God has ordained it to be. And I think we need to be clear on that from the start, that God has told us what church is, that God has defined it for us, he has described it for us, he has shown us how the church is to work, and so church is not what I want, and church is not what you want, church is what God has said it to be. And I think in our culture today, we've given ourselves to a lot of things and we've worked a lot of avenues that we like to call church that biblically just is not. And I'm afraid some of us are going to get, some of us are going to spend a lot of time and effort working really hard to prepare what we think is best. It's like the cook in the kitchen. Buddy, he labors over that spaghetti and he cooks it and everything's just perfect and it's topped with the cheese just right and the waiter or waitress takes it out to the table. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter how hard he worked on the spaghetti, if when it gets to the table, the customer says, well, I ordered steak. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to matter how hard we worked on this, what we call church, what we want church to be, what we think it ought to be. It matters what God has ordered it to be and ordained it to be. Church is so important because you and I are not called to follow Christ alone. We are called to follow Christ together. And do you know what we call that? We call that church. So this morning we're going to lay a foundation. We're going to go back to the Bible and define what is church. Roman numeral one, if you're taking notes this morning, I want to look at the formation of the church. The formation of the church. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 18 of Matthew 16 again. Jesus says, and he said, I, and, he, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock. What is that rock 
that Jesus was talking about? Well, he was talking about Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the very Son of God. He is the Messiah come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, upon this rock, the confession of Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to see first of all this morning when we consider the formation of the church that it was foretold by the Savior. Jesus said there in verse number 18, he said, I will build my church. And while on earth we see that the doctrine of Jesus really laid the foundation for the church, but it was not the church. Jesus spoke of the church as something in the future in comparison to his earthly ministry. And so what we see is the church is not what was going on with Jesus and the apostles in the Gospels. What we see is that church is not what was going on in the Old Testament with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the children of Israel, the promised land, the prophets. That the church is something new. We see in 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 10, Peter writes this concerning the church, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And we see here in Peter, we see in Ephesians, we see in Colossians, that the church is something new that God has done. It is the gathering of all people, whether they're Jew or Gentile, whether they're bond or free, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're man or woman. It is the gathering together of all people unto Christ. And so the church was foretold by the Savior. I want us to see as well that Jesus not only prepared for the church with his doctrine. But he also purchased the church with his death. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28 puts it this way. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And we see here the formation of the church foretold by the Savior. It was, it was prepared for with his doctrine. It was purchased with his death. And so we see foretold by the Savior. But not only was the church foretold by the Savior, but it was really founded when it was filled by the Spirit. Now the Bible teaches that the church as we know it was formed when the Holy Spirit indwelt believers at Pentecost. Let me give you a couple verses that will help you with that. In Acts chapter 5, in Acts chapter 1, sorry, in verse number 5, Jesus made uh, this statement just before he ascended into heaven. He said, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, let me explain something really important about what this word baptized means. So often we think of being baptized as what we do back here. You know, we pull up the little wooden thing, we fill it with water, we turn on the heater and hopefully it works, and people come in and who have trusted Christ as their Savior, and they are baptized. They are immersed in the water, representing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and their decision and their uh, 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 commitment to walk in newness of life. Now, when we understand being baptized with the Holy Ghost, that is not what we're talking about. The word baptism, it means to immerse, but it also means to put her to place. And so what we see here is the Holy Ghost is, is putting us or placing us into the body of Christ. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13. It says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, 
and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And so it is by one spirit that we are baptized or placed into one body. What is that body? It is the body of Christ. What is it that is the body of Christ here on earth today? It is the church. Very good. And so at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and, 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 and filled and dwelt and filled those believers, it baptized those believers into the body of Christ and the church was born. And from that point on, we see in our experience that, that when a man or woman, boy or girl, comes to faith in Christ, that they are at that moment baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Now, think about this with me. The formation of the church, it is bought by the blood, and it is filled with the Spirit. Can I start this morning by saying it? This morning, you are not born again. If you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you are not a part of the church. You're not. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9 tells us this, that if you don't have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If there is no salvation, then there is no Spirit. If there is no Spirit, then there is no church. And just because you come and sit in a pew once a week or twice a week or three times a week, just because you might serve, just because you might give, just because you might do any number of things, it does not make you a Christian. It does not make you part of the church of Jesus Christ. No more than living in a garage makes you a car. Living in a library or going to a library makes you a scholar or going to the gym makes you an athlete. If the, inter if the internet has taught us anything, it's that just because people put on a pair of tennis shoes, it does not make them an athlete. There is a whole genre of things out there just watching people fail miserably. If you're not saved this morning, you are are not the church. It was foretold by the Savior, bought with His blood, filled with the Spirit. Bought by the blood, filled by the Spirit. Even from the formation this morning, do you see how important the church is? It is bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, I've paid for some things, but I have never paid for anything with my blood. Can you imagine how valuable something would have to be to pay for it with your blood? Not only was it bought with his blood, it is indwelt by his spirit. In other words, his spirit lives within us. A a privilege that no other of God's people has ever known throughout human history. That God's Spirit lives within us. Do you see how precious the church is to Jesus? Do you see how important this thing is to God? This is not something to mess around with. This is not something to fit to ourselves. This is something for us to fit ourselves Two. Do you see the distinction? This is not something that we want to make work for us. This is something that we give ourselves to work to. The formation of the church. Foretold by the Savior. And filled by the Spirit. I want you to see, secondly, this morning, the fundamentals of the church. In that same verse, verse number 18, when Jesus makes the comment that upon this rock I will build my church, 
Here we see a, a very specific word that's being used. And I want to give you a definition of this and work through it if we could. The Greek word here is ekklesia. And it is a Greek word that means called out or called together. Now, in a very general sense, ecclesia refers to any group who have come apart or come together for a purpose. Meaning, in Greek culture, it was often used of the councils that, that would be there in the cities or the regions. The, these men who were called out from the population for a specific purpose. It's used for a number of different groups in a general sense. You'll remember, uh, I believe it's in Acts, uh, when Paul and them are in Ephesus and, and the great mob rises up and, and seeks to drag some of these believers and they, and they kind of start a riot. The word that's used for the mob, the riotous mob that, that rose up is this word, ecclesia. Because in a general sense, it is a group who has come out from the populace for a specific purpose. In the New Testament, one other time it's used, and it refers back to the nation of Israel. Why? Because in a general sense, the nation of Israel was called out from among the peoples of the earth for a specific purpose. So we see the general sense of what this word means. Now... Would a Greek city council be considered a church as we know it? No. Very good. It wasn't a trick question. It wasn't. Okay. Hopefully this one will be even easier. Was the angry, heathen, riotous mob in Acts, were they a New Testament church as we know it? No. Was Israel a New Testament church as we know it? No. No. But in a general sense, it means any called out or people group who've come together for a specific purpose. Now, biblically, and this is where we have to start defining our terms and getting our distinctions. Biblically here, the word church has a very specific and very specialized meaning. And it's a term that refers to those who are called out or called together by Christ for his glory. We have been called out. We have been called together for a purpose. We see verses like uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse number 9. Refers, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You see, God had ordained that all who would place their faith in Jesus Christ would be called out of darkness, would be brought out of the kingdom of death and into the kingdom of life, out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, that, that we would no longer be aliens or strangers, but that we would become a part of the house Hold of faith. God has called us out of this world, and God has called us to himself. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 13, we see a similar note. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And so it is those who are called out or called together by Christ for his glory. It has to do with a people and a purpose. We'll make it simple. It has to do with a people and a purpose. Now here's where we need the distinction. Because this is where a lot of people go crazy. If I run into your family in Walmart. Are we now church? Well the Bible says where two or three are gathered together and. But have we come to Walmart for the purpose of meeting to glorify God and do his will? No, we've come to Walmart to buy milk and bread. It's good fellowship, but ladies and gentlemen, running into you at Walmart, whether there's two or three or ten of us, is not church. Okay? 
What about when our ladies and our gentlemen go to Greenspring School on Thursday afternoon and they have those kids there in that classroom after school and they're teaching them Bible stories and they're singing Bible songs and they're giving them candy and snacks to send them sugared up home to mom and dad. Uh, what, what about that? Or, or, or is it church then? I mean, they've met together and, and, and they're there to look at the Word of God and to sing His praises. Is that church then? No. No, that's a gathering together of some elementary age kids for the purpose of discipleship and evangelism. Yes, and there's glorifying of God, and, and yes, there is his, but it is not the people of God coming together for the purpose of God. This, ladies and gentlemen, is church. The people of God come together for the purpose of God. When we, when we go out on visitation and we're here and we're this, ladies and gentlemen, when the people of God gather for the purpose of God, this is church. That's why, that's why the small groups that we have are, are Bible studies. We don't have mini church in the gym. We have Bible study. We have Sunday school. You see, the purposes that God has given us, you, you look at things like the officers of the church and the ordinances of the church, and you look at the orders that the church has been given. They're very specific. It is not what we want to make it. And it is not just the people of God getting together for, for what we want. It is when we get together to fulfill the purpose that God has given us corporate. That is church. That is church. Church is a body of people who have been called out from the world. Called out from the world by God's grace and called together to serve Him and by glorifying Him in a local body of baptized believers associated by covenant and faith and fellowship of the gospel. Church is the body of people who have been called out from the world by God's grace and called together to serve Him by glorifying Him in a local body of believers associated by covenant in faith and fellowship of the gospel. And we'll talk about this in sermons to come, but you see, God has given the church leaders, and God has given the church ordinances, and God has given the church orders. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of good groups where, where the church will kind of break off and do different things at times. But ladies and gentlemen, there is no substitution for what we do now. When we gather together as God's people, old, young, rich, poor, we gather together in His name to do His work. It's definition. It is a people who are called out or called together for a purpose. We see the definition of what a church is. But I also want us to note here, not only its definition, but its director. You know, our English word church traces its root back to a Greek word, kyriakon, which means simply belonging to the Lord. And so our word church traces its root back to a word that literally means belonging to the Lord. What a good reminder that church is not my idea. That church is not mine to mold to meet my needs. That church belongs to God. It is His. Paul reminds us, and there are verses all like this in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 9. The Bible, Paul wrote, For I am least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church, the church what? The church of God. The church belongs to God. 
We are called out from the world and called to God for his glory. And you have to have both aspects. That's the people and the purpose. We are called out from the world and we are called to God. We belong to him. I'll give you an example. I've used this before, but I think it helps to illustrate things. You know, one of the things that, that God uses to illustrate the church's relationship to him is that we are the bride of Christ. Now, suppose with me, for instance, in a, in a physical sense, consider my wife and I. When we got married some 10 plus years ago, we made a commitment to one another. And in doing so, we came out from among the general populace and we, we, we were separated in that we were no longer on the market. In other words, after I said, I do, there would have been great issue if I were running around talking to other girls, texting other girls, hanging out with other girls, going on dates with other girls. There'd be issue with that, right? And you say, that'd be awful. You ought to have the snot beat out of you. You ought to be strung up from a high tree. and That'd be awful. You're a wicked person. We, we know that, that we are called out from others. No more. But you know, that's only one half of marriage. If I, if I forsake other women, but I don't give myself to my wife, well then, buddy, I've really missed out on what marriage is all about. Because you see, there are a lot of marriages in our, in, our, in our day and age that are just like that. Human beings cohabitating. They don't share a whole lot more than space. Because you see, it's not just enough to come out from the world. It's not just enough to say no to other women. I have to give myself to my bride. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what church is. You know what? We get saved and we say, bye-bye world. You know, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And, and, I, and, and you know what, devil? You know what? You can say what you want and try what you want. But you know what? I'm going to heaven and you're not. And we, we say, bye-bye world. And we're so glad that we don't have the, the penalty of sin. And, and we're not going to have that punishment. But you know what a lot of people miss? They want to come out to reap the benefits, but they don't want to give themselves to Almighty God. The church belongs to God, ladies and gentlemen. The church belongs to God. This is not Alan Holmes' church. This is God's church. Mike Neisler is our, our, our corporation president. But this is not Mike Neisler's church. Mike, remember that at the deacons meeting tonight, okay? It's not your church. This is God's church. When Pastor Lewis retired two years ago, you know the great thing was? The person in charge of the church didn't change. It's his church. It's his. And you will never get what you need to. You will never know church for what it's meant to be if you do not give yourself, not only removed from the world, but to God Almighty. Can I bring it home to you? I don't believe understanding church the way the Bible teaches it. I don't believe that we church, we ought to church shop. Meaning, let's see what church fits my fancy. It belongs to him. If I belong to him and the church belongs to him, doesn't it just make, make sense that I say, Lord, what church would you call me to? And then, if God has called me to a place, because I belong to him and it belongs to him, doesn't it? And so if God calls me to a place, guess what? If the preacher starts wearing a funny mic on his face instead of a lapel and it looks weird, I'm not going to get offended and not come back next week. If your kid bites mine in the nursery, I'm not going to get offended and not come back next week. Because you didn't call me here, he did. If they change the color of the carpet or buy a different brand of vacuum cleaner, 
stepping on toes now, I'm not going to get offended. Because I didn't come here for the vacuum cleaner, and I didn't come here for the color of the carpet, and I didn't come here for you. I came here because God called me here. You know what? God can call me away, but I had better be real sure because church is that important. It was bought by His blood. It is filled with His Spirit. It is His called out people. We belong to Him. And so you find out where God would call you to and you jump in with both feet and don't apologize to anybody. I tell you this too. Some people ask, well, why do we have to get baptized? Because He told us to. And it's his church. Well, why do we need to take communion? Why do we need to do the Lord's Supper? Because he told us to. And it's his church. Well, why do we need to give? I don't understand why we need to tithe. I don't understand why we need to go. I don't understand why we need to love everybody. I look out on those people, and I, some of them, you know what? I just don't even like to look at them, much less love them. I don't un- Why? Because he told us to. And it belongs to him. He's King Jesus. He's God. We're not. The fundamentals of the church. I tell you, if we could get a hold of that right there, that would flip what we think we know about church on its head. But I tell you what it would do, it would root you in the truth. The formation of the church. The fundamentals of the church. Quickly this morning, the function of the church. I want you to see Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came in power and dwelt the church. The church was born. Peter walked out of that upper room and the Lord began to move and miracles began to happen. And Peter rose up and... He preached a couple verses on repentance. He preached a couple verses on the resurrection. And the Bible says that 3,000 souls came to know Jesus Christ that day. And I want you to see how quickly the church began to function. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Why? Because he told them to. And the same, they were added unto them about 3,000 thousand souls. Now look what the church does. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and of prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Can I point out here just a few functions of the church? How does the church function? Number one, it functions in faith. I mentioned it before and it bears repeating. It functions in faith. If you are not born again, you cannot be a part of the church. You cannot. You cannot. You must be born again. But it wasn't just that they were saved. Yes, it started there and it has to start there. But look at verse 42 again. It says this, and they continued steadfastly in what? In the apostles, say it church, doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Listen to me, okay? Church unity does not come in spite of doctrine. It comes because of doctrine. We've got this false idea of unity out there. Let's just set aside our differences. Let's just set aside God's word. And, and let's, just, let's just put all of that behind us and, and we can find things that we agree on. How about we just agree that God's word is God's word? That it's black and white, that it's clear, that the Holy Spirit will guide us. And ladies and gentlemen, the church's unity does not come in spite of doctrine. It comes because of doctrine. I want you to see how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 3. It says this, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So where does this unity come from? Verse number 4, and there is one body. What's that referring to? To the church and one Spirit. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. 
Verse number five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. What was it that is the basis for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? It was the clear, unified doctrine of Scripture. It's about doctrine. Why do you think we're taking so much time rooting ourselves in doctrine? Because doctrine matters. What the Bible teaches matters. And when you lay aside what the Bible teaches and you root yourself in anything else, you no longer have church. You might have a country club. You might have a social gathering. Some of them are just glorified political events these days. Some of them are just so some narcissistic man can, can spout off what he thinks. But it's not church. It might be a number of things, but it's not church. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine because doctrine is that bond that holds fast and doctrine doesn't change. Doctrine doesn't change. And by the way, for the sake of the unity of the church, the doctrine of this book will never be up for general debate. We will not. In our Bible study classes, we will not, in casual conversation, sit around and generally debate the sound doctrines of the Bible. Because this is our bond of unity. This is. How did the church function? They functioned in faith. They functioned in fellowship. Did you catch that in verse number 42? The Bible says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. If you look at verses number 44 and 45, it goes a little more in depth. It said, And all that believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. A couple of things here. The church operated in fellowship. Yes, this means they operated in community. No one is designed to go it alone. If there are issues with your fellowship, there are issues with your faith. Because no one is designed to go it alone. So yes, this means in community, but it also means in contribution. You see that they willingly had all things in common. Can I tell you the root for the word fellowship? We think it means shaking hands and smiling at people and telling them we're glad to see them whether we really are or not. Because that's what fellowship is. No, fellowship has the idea of giving of giving, giving of ourselves, of of deep and intense, practical generosity. Whether it's time, whether it's talents, whether it's treasure like we saw in Acts chapter 2. Fellowship has the idea of not just not just, just this, this base surface community, but a deep sense of ownership and generosity one to another. And this is how the church operated. They operated in faith. They operated in fellowship, but also in focus. You know, when Jesus left, he gave his followers orders, did he not? We see in Matthew 28, beginning in verse number 18, he reminded them, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Just before he, he rose there in the book of Acts, he told them that they would be witnesses unto him in Jerusalem and in Judea and into Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the church function, they function in unity of faith and fellowship, but also in focus. It was about the command of Christ to go and to reach the world. And you know what you find? You read the book of Acts. You know what you find? You find people who were passionately obsessed about spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ 
to the ends of the earth. It wasn't, boy, I hope they sing songs I like today. They were passionately obsessed. Their focus was on reaching the world. On reaching the world. Focused on the command of Christ. But you know what else? They were focused on the coming of Christ. That blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the church functioned. Might I gently suggest this morning that most of what we call church isn't church. That most of what we want from church isn't church. That most of the excuses that we give for not coming or for not being more involved in church have nothing to do with church. I can't tell you how many times I've heard the idea that I can't come because there's hypocrites there. Well, good. Can you think of a better place for a hypocrite to be than somewhere where they can hear the word of God Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? I can't. Heard somebody say once, well, the church is full of, is a pit of vipers just like the world. The only difference is the world knows it. No, 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 the world doesn't. The way of a man, the Bible says, is right in his own eyes. This world has no clue. They are so sincere in what they do, but they are sincerely sinful. It ought to be that the people who know they have a problem is the church. And if you think the church is a den of vipers, I would encourage you to slither on in sometime. Because we got room for you here too. What is church? It is that which Jesus purchased with his blood. It is that which Jesus filled with his spirit. It is a people of God called out by God, called together by God. And it's not about, it's not about my choice. It's about what God is doing. One faith, one fellowship, one focus. And, and here it is. Here it is. If we don't take anything else away, in an age of rugged individualism, both individually as a man and as a family. We live in an age where everybody wants to do their own thing. I'm going to do it my way. And that's part of the, that's part of the American charm, is it not? I'm going to do it my way. In an age of rugged individualism, there is still a biblical call. There is still a biblical command to come out and to come together as God's people for faith, fellowship, and the furtherance of the gospel. Now here we go. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. You travel to other places. You know what you realize? We are so blessed here in Clyde. You hear missionaries talk about what they go through on the foreign field, as Brother Frank alluded to this morning. And you know what you find? You find we are so blessed. Is this a perfect church? No. But you will not find a perfect church. All churches are broken because they're made up of broken people. Understand that. All churches are broken because all churches are made up of broken people. But we are so blessed. And the trouble is, is when you're this blessed, it is really easy to take for granted what you do have. And church, here's the challenge. It's time that when it comes to the church, that we take our explanation from God. It's time that when it comes to church, we take our emphasis from God. It is time to get on board with what this church thing is really all about.
Father, we love you.